everyone, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that the Japanese snow monkey washes its food in seawater, actually preferentially over fresh water. And they do this to clean their food the way a raccoon does, but they also like to enhance the flavor with salt. So apparently we're not the only animals who like to eat salt. Today's guest is a really interesting guy and, and someone I, I really respect and admire. He's the author of 11 books, including the New York Times bestseller called Now Eat This and The Pound a Day Diet, which actually you don't eat a pound of butter a day, I, I hear, although uh -huh. I might try it. Uh, he entered the Culinary Institute of America at the age of 16 and 18 was working with legendary worldwide chefs. Uh, he's a James Beard award-winning chef, opened a three-star restaurant called Union Pacific in New York City, which was a culinary landmark for years. He was named Food & Wine's best new chef and was the first chef to be on the cover of Gourmet as America's most exciting young chef. In other words, this guy's a kick-ass chef. But that's not why I wanted to have him on the show because I have great respect for people who are really good in the kitchen, both from a flavor and a composition perspective, but also from like an entrepreneurial and management organizational perspective. But it's that Rocco's new book is Cook Your Butt Off, Lose a Pound a Day. Here we have a chef cooking food to make you lose weight. Now, the stereotypical guy who's running a you know, stereotypical chef tends to have a few extra pounds. And Rocco, by the way, you know, welcome. It, do you find among your contemporaries there's a little bit of extra weight gain? Uh, I was going to say respect and admiration is not going to come cheap, is it, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to owe you for that? Uh, you know, the, there's, a, there's a change in the trend of chefs being typically overweight or obese. Most of us were until very recently. I'd like to say I led the charge, but there's definitely been a few chefs who've caught on and, uh, you know, lost some weight, uh, and gotten healthy, did Iron Man, you know, like I did. And, uh, Gordon Ramsay comes to mind. Joe Bastianich, uh, comes to mind. Uh, now even Marco Canora has written a book called a good food day. He's, uh, he sort of had a come to Jesus moment mm -hmm. like I did with his doctor where, you know, at 20 years, 30 years of being a chef and a butterholic, uh, you uh, you you hit a wall and you realize this can't continue. The late nights, the drinking, the the overindulging of foie gras, you know, at every every oh, chance. There's no such uh, thing just has as, to as stop. Yeah. overindulging foie gras. That... See, I used to think that that was the case, <laughs> but after my thousandth piece, I think if I don't see another piece of foie gras again, it won't be too soon. Um, but so yeah, the, we're usually not in great shape. Uh, we're not in great emotional shape, physical shape. We're uh, chefs are a mess. So for me, getting out of the restaurant business in 2005 was my opportunity to, to clean up my act. So it, it was actually getting out that let you do it. Because I, I know you, you, as a, a professional chef, you work just brutal hours. Like, what's a typical work week for a professional chef look like? It, to, to call it a work week would be a fallacy. It's really what's a typical life week, you know, and your entire life is is 99% consumed by your restaurant. And especially if you have a restaurant like I did, Union Pacific, three stars, very cutting edge at the time, a total passion project, uh, and all about the vision I had for food at the time. And th th there's never there's no leaving it. Even when you lock the doors at night, you're still tethered to it. And, you know, all your employees have your, your cell phone number and your customers are, uh, you know, friends and, uh, everything that comes out of the kitchen is, is, uh, it's, it's like part of your cellular structure. So you want it to be perfect. It, it's that, that attachment to perfection that attracts me to the idea of, of being a chef. And it's also that idea of perfection for, I want to look and feel good versus yeah. I just want it to taste good. And, and one of the one of my biggest complaints with the traditional model of cooking is that you can do like what uh, what you'll find from Nathan Mervold in modernist cuisine, which is right, right. shockingly amazing stuff. I, I've been into sous vide, which is that cooking yeah. technique for people listening yeah. who don't know, where you put your meat or your vegetables in a in a plastic bag and you cook it at a precise temperature in a water bath, like you would in a laboratory, and you get these amazing circulator. Flavors. Yeah. And the circulator. So, so Nathan wrote about this a long time ago and I started doing it in like an old sushi cooker with like a laboratory thing and it was super ghetto because that was the only way you could do it back in the day. Yeah. And 
what, what was different there is that Nathan has created the world's most perfect French fry. And it has three different kinds of oils, three different cooking things, and it's all based on hardcore chemistry and science and biochemistry. And cooking is moving in that direction, but his end goal was like the most orgasmic french fry experience. And the end goal for like, like my perspective and yours in cook your butt off is okay, what's the food gonna do for you? Like you want it to taste good, but like what's in yeah. it for me? And, and yeah. you struck me as one of the first professional chef guys to really start thinking about that rather than like, you know, bow down to the granola sticks and twigs and all that, but to be like, all right, it, it's about the flavor, but at the end of the day, if it tastes good and I look like this, then I'm not getting it. And so hats off. I mean, you, you've written 11 books about this over the past 11 years. Thank you so much. I mean, you brought up about 20 topics there that we could spend hours talking about. I would, I would love to go through them one by one. Um, about modernist cuisine, it's interesting that you think Nathan invented it when it's really derivative of Ferran Adria's work ah. uh, in the 80s and 90s, and he's almost over it himself at this point. That's, that's, uh, that's how long it's been around. The idea of, of cooking something a certain way for the sake of it is not attractive to me. But let me tell you this about modernist cooking or for Ferran's, you know, molecular kind of cooking. It actually helps me achieve um, a mouthfeel, luxury in food, and it helps me take away sugar and processed ingredients and fats and replace them with other ingredients that, that give the food a luxury, a luxurious, delicious uh, feeling. So I'm using this now, the, I'm using molecular gastronomy and modernist yeah. techniques more now than I ever have, even when I ran a restaurant that was, you know, a cutting edge restaurant. So there is definitely some place in our, in our world for that. I think to, you know, uh, make foie gras couscous just because you can <laughs> isn't necessarily a great idea. You know, even Ferran Adria, when I ate at his restaurant, Al Bouilly, said, I do these things because, because I have this forum. And I can. Yeah. They don't all taste good, but if they don't taste good, I won't make them again. And we usually create a new menu for every season anyway. But he was inventing a new way of looking at cooking, a new science protocol, uh, a new philosophy. And when you, you're the guy who invented it, that's cool. But when you're just doing you know, iterative stuff and you're, you're, your cuisine is derivative, uh, I've, I think you should come up with a, your own point of view. But I'm really happy that all that science is out there and that I can, I can use, you know, spherical encapsulation to make nudie that would normally require a lot of wheat flour and full fat ricotta. And because of that technique, I can make it at two thirds less calories. So it's, there's some great stuff about that. So one of the, one of the ways a chef would know that someone liked their food is, is they want to order more, right? That is a good indication, <laughs> sure. Okay. Oh, and to your point about food wanting, to, you want you, me wanting food to do more than just taste good, um, it's really interesting you bring that up because I often describe where I am now at, as um, at a place where I not only can make food to, to cause pleasure in people, to, get, to make them happy, to make them feel good, to help them you know, close deals, do whatever it is that the food enables them to do, but the food will also help them live longer yeah. and enjoy those moments for a much longer period of time. Before I made food that made people happy, very happy. Um, you know, I, it was like having my own one man show on Broadway. It was, it was incredible, but I did nothing for their health, much less mine, which is why, uh, you know, after 10 years of running that restaurant, my doctor half jokingly said, you know, write your will, you're in trouble, buddy. And this is at 35 years old. And this is the faith that most of us face if we don't uh, have a come to Jesus moment with our choices and our lifestyle and make some serious changes. 67% of America is in trouble and something's got to change. How do you deal with, uh, with food cravings? Because I, I found that I used to make foods that people loved because they couldn't stop eating it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, it's easy. I never did this, but like at, at the very end of the extreme, like, well, just add cocaine. You know, like the original Coca Cola. <laughs> like, oh, like, I love this food. I'm so happy. I can't stop. So, you know, that's the one idea I never <laughs> thought of. I should have. Oh, my God, make it addictive. Just like the big food companies have, right? Well, they, they have. Yeah. But, but some of the yeah. things you can do in a kitchen to create that thing that's so amazing, people just have to get more. It, it, 
it's not meant, to, and it doesn't come from the same spirit as, as you know, you can't eat just one kind of, of you know, marketing and, and food chemistry. But sometimes if you're a chef and you're making a food that makes people uh, crave or makes people have overeating, how do you know? I mean, you, you may know now, but if, if you're running a restaurant, it, it's almost like you're getting a signal from the, 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 give me more, give me more. And like, well, this is good. Are you maybe using that, uh, accidentally using that signal to make foods that are craving inducing? So um, I, I could never figure out how to um, intentionally create a food that people would crave. I would intentionally create foods that I thought had brilliant balance in flavor, that had a beginning, middle, and an end. There was a crescendo and a resolution in every bite. That's what I tried to do. Yeah. Um, in terms of physical and, and chemical uh, cr cravings, I, I don't know that I was that sophisticated at the time. I mean, I know the big food companies figured that out in the 50s, and, and that's why we're all addicted to Doritos, but um, <laughs> that wasn't part of my deal. And, and in terms of food critics, um, you know, being a chef who was once a darling of the food critics and then became you know, uh, the pariah of the food <laughs> critics, uh, I've seen both sides. So, uh, and they're, they're both, uh, they were both, they were opposite ends of the spectrum and I felt both extremes and it's really interesting to 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 be on the one side and then all of a sudden find yourself through through uh, you know as a complete surprise on the other side but food critics um played an important role in the development of the american uh chef the independent and courageous american chef the american chef who could come up with his own cuisine before that only european chefs were celebrated we worked with those guys. We begged to work with those guys. We we brushed you know their floors with toothbrushes for them for free <laughs> just to work with them. I went to Paris and lived there for two years at an, at 18 years old and slept on the subways so I could have a chance to work with a French chef you know for free of course. Um, and it was uh, American food critics that finally set us free and and sort of declared. Uh, in the in the mid to mid '80s, let's say, uh, with Jeremiah Tower and Wolfgang Puck, that you know American chefs have, uh, are here. They have arrived. They have a point of view, and now they've got all this great skill that they learned from the French masters. So, without the food critics, I don't think that would have happened. Um, it's interesting because now Yelp is the most important food critic <laughs> out there, and you know what that's like, right? I mean, anyone who has uh, internet can write a review on Yelp. Uh, but but um, if it's so, a positive review, it doesn't get displayed unless you pay the Yelp fee, right? I didn't know that. Is that right? Yeah, that's it, so it's, a, it's a known issue with a lot of small restaurants. It, it's really hurting them because you, know, you, you end up basically paying a fee or only negative comments appear. That's too bad. Yeah. I, I, it's really too bad. You know, it's interesting. I, I thought Zagat would become that yeah. for restaurants online, um, but I guess they they missed that moment, or they weren't an early adopter enough to to find the moment where they should have jumped in there. But uh, I, I haven't answered your question in full because you asked fifteen questions. I, I like which, to do that. Which I love. I love that. By the way, yeah. <laughs> that, that way, I know you'll answer the one that was most important to you and ignore the rest, yeah. which is totally cool. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant technique, brilliant technique. Did you uh, did you study with Howard Stern? Uh, I did not study with Howard one Stern. One of the greatest, one of the greatest interviewers ever. He does the same thing. It, it, he brings up a million topics and then lets them go. He'd be a really interesting guy to meet sometime. But once he went over to satellite radio, I, I sort of lost touch with what he was working on. Uh, yeah. Cool. Well, I want to ask you a question uh, that's yeah. uh, maybe more personal, and you, and you can sort of sure. talk about it or not. But going from darling to uh, basically pariah over that time frame, what did that yeah. do to you as as a writer of books, as a, a chef, just as a human being? Like like having that huge swing in, in perception. Like, what was the psychological experience of it, and how did you deal with it? So after my um, my. Psyche being crushed, you mean, and recovering from that? <laughs> yeah. So what I, happened, I, and how I'll did you share, recover? I'll share a secret with you. I've been I've been in therapy since second grade, so <laughs> uh, that's always been what's gotten me through everything that I've experienced in life that was difficult. Um, you know, it was obviously a, a difficult time uh, to try to be the pioneer in reality television as it relates to chefs and restaurants. You know, I was probably three years too early. And I guess someone had to pave the way, right? Because soon after my show, Top Chef appeared and 
Now there's 40 or 50 shows that do things that are far worse than anything we did on that show. Um, here's a really funny, fun fact. I still don't know to this day what was real and what was not real on my own television show about my own restaurant. Wow. Things were manipulated so masterfully that I literally couldn't tell you what the truth was. <laughs> People ask me all the time, did that happen to that? And I, and I say, I don't know if it really happened. I know it was recorded on television, but I don't know how that moment ended up coming to being because uh, it was really like marionettes. With, it was amazing, amazing, amazing process to watch. Uh, but so what happened to me then was I, I learned a huge life lesson pretty young and, and several. And one of those is how you can't focus on too many things at one time and be good at all of them. And so I had to make a decision, and I decided to give up restaurants, which surprised me and everyone else in the world, uh, especially the culinary world. Uh, they didn't take well to the fact that the guy they sort of uh, cheered on for so many years abandoned what they, they thought abandoned the culinary world. So um, I just was following my natural interests and instincts and just doing what makes me happy, not really realizing that I was going to be out of the restaurant business up, up till you know 2015, which is uh, exactly 10 years now. Well, I, I may be following the opposite track. I, I don't come from the, from the restaurant business. I, I once did work at Baskin Robbins uh, scooping ice cream. Uh, I, I could do a cocktail where you throw the scoop up in the air and catch it on a cone. That, that was kind of cool. That's a very valuable skill. Don't ever, don't ever forget how to do that. <laughs> totally right. <laughs> and that's like the extent of my food prep experience. But yeah. we're opening the Bulletproof Coffee Shop in Santa Monica um, in oh, that, end of end of March, early April, and it it has food. We have a full kitchen in the back. And we were lucky to get a former Ilfornayo at a small location. And uh, I, I don't know a lot about it, but I have a, a team who, who does. And I'm, I'm really hopeful that some of the ideas that I've been working on uh, around creating a, you know, satiety and, and just being, being full and satisfied, uh, uh, that, that they come to fruition there. But hearing someone who left the restaurant scene because it's so hectic, I'm wondering if I'm just you know, walking into a buzzsaw here. But <laughs> we'll, we'll find out. There's about a 90% chance you are, but you'll, you're one of those guys who's always in the 10%. I have a feeling that your, uh, your skills, your luck, and your intelligence will get you through the experience. Um, you, start, you said you, got, you have a small space? Oh, yeah. It, it's going to be that, that's smart. stuff that's where smart. It, it, it's, a, it's a bulletproof coffee shop, and it's about the coffee. But there's a full, right. uh, not a full, but there's a menu of, of things you can have for lunch and dinner that are really filling. There's yeah. you know, four tables in, indoors, maybe, if we're lucky, and some tables outside because it's Santa Monica. But the, the idea there is, um, is to showcase how food can make you feel and to just let people see, look, go, now go do this at home. You don't have to come here. Like, this isn't a giant restaurant. It, it, Understood. Yeah. It's it's like in the spirit of just demonstrating things. It's a it's a way for you to prove your, the theories that you write about. Yeah, and I, I get it. I understand that. Um, so starting small is great. I'm sure you do you'll do fantastically well. Um, and teaching people about satiety and how to eat well is is something that we need so badly. Um, and don't worry about the critics. Just make sure <laughs> the restaurant's always full. Uh, there's a great restaurateur in New York. Um, Keith McNally, who has never closed a restaurant. He opened Lucky Strike in 1982, and it's still open. He owns Balthazar. He's never, ever once been concerned about what critics say, and his restaurants are always full. He's always about the experience, making sure the customer experience is as great as it can be. So, um, so in the restaurant business, we have a term. It's called Teflon. It's used in a lot of fields. Uh, but some restaurants are Teflon, no matter how, how bad the food is or how bad the reviews are. They just got something that brings people to it. So you are not Teflon. You're even better. You're bulletproof. <laughs> Man, I like to think so. so. I mean, you, so you have everything going in your direction. Well, which is great. Fing fingers crossed. And uh, all right. The reason the reason I started to uh, serve my food in a food truck was because I'd written all these books about healthy and delicious not being mutually exclusive. That was a basic conceit of all my work that healthy and delicious should not be mutually exclusive. And up till the day I discovered that healthy lobster bisque is better, than, uh, better tasting than unhealthy lobster bisque because the volatile oils in lobster are hydrophilic, not lipophilic, meaning they stick to water, not to fat. And we've been 
cooking lobsters and cream for about 500 years, thinking that was the best way to do it, I realized I was really I was stumbling into something incredibly exciting. You can have indulgent, delicious, uh, satisfying foods that are a third of the calories that aren't processed, that don't have high fructose corn syrup in them. And uh, I, I started a food truck just to prove to people that what I was saying in the books is actually true here. You can come taste this food. So I, I really get why you're doing it. And uh, obviously it comes from a very important, uh, a good place and an important point of view. So you'll do really well. D did you like Ratatouille, the movie? Of course. <laughs> How could you not like it? Was a, it was a great movie. Perfect movie. The, there was a, the speech at the end about credit. I have a pretty low standard for movies, okay. by the way. <laughs> yeah, as long as it doesn't, if it distracts me from real life for two hours, I'm pretty happy. But... But go ahead. You like that one, all right. Yeah. Um, uh, Tim Ferriss, I, I've actually not seen the movie, and Tim Ferriss recommended on, on Bulletproof Radio that, that he's like, Dave, you need to see it. Like, that's, that's my recipe yeah. for critics. Uh, and, and it was great because there's that speech at the very end about restaurant critics, and, and it, was, it was kind of funny because, you know, food critics, like you said, they, they, they can bring attention and they can make people care about the art. And I'm hoping soon the art and the science of this so that it becomes something that's part of our national discourse. Where did our food come from? How is it grown? How is it prepared? And when it was, you know, put on your plate, like the whole system of food, I, I hope food critics become a part of that. But if they don't, like that speech at the end of Ratatouille, <laughs> if, for me, it was inspiring anyway. <laughs> I, t I totally get it. I mean, I, th I think there are important writers who are uh, joining the conversation of lunatics like us about, you know, food, origin, provenance, sustainability, health. Um, I think more, more than just you, me, and JJ Virgin realize that what's happening in this country is unsustainable and we're in serious trouble. You know, I, I was watching a movie uh, about the Iran-Contra uh, affair, remember in the yeah. 80s, Reagan, Iran-Contra, Ali North, and uh, he was quoted as saying, um, crack cocaine is the biggest threat to the, to the American way. It's not Russia, it's not terrorists, and uh, I feel like updating that by saying obesity is the biggest threat to the American way. It's not ISIS, you know, it's not what's going on in the Middle East, it's not uh, the suicide bombers we're all obsessed with and the snowmageddons that we continue to be obsessed, <laughs> obsessed with. I don't know if you know about our snowmageddon <laughs> near Miss here in New York. There was supposed to be a snowmageddon and of course it didn't happen. But we're, we're so concerned about the weather, about ISIS, about, uh, you know, uh, what our children's uh, video games are. Yet we, we buy into this system of slowly poisoning each other over a lifetime and causing a myriad of diseases that are killing more Americans than everything else combined. Like, what the fuck is going on? This is madness. It, it is, and it's something... It's got to stop. It's something we have control of, right? It, it's totally it, something we have control of. It's all conscious. You, you make a conscious choice, you're going to make a great choice. The problem is most of us are living unconsciously. We do not make choices and while we're thinking. We just, we crave, we indulge, and that's not a conscious process, yep. you know. That's a, a that's a physical response to to a physical craving, right? If you if you g gave every American a good choice and a bad choice and taught them how to be conscious about their choices, I bet you ninety seven percent of them would choose the good choice. And that's what I'm trying to do with this food. I'm trying to I'm trying to create thousands of foods that uh, are delicious and healthy at the same time and make those available for just about everyone out there. Uh, it's, a, it's a giant goal and uh, I love it that you brought up JJ and, Virgin. And so are you, and so are you. Buddy. Oh, thank you. I mean, we're, yeah. there's a bunch of us now that there's probably about a, a hundred people I've gotten to know, uh, you among them uh, through JJ Virgin and, and guys like Joe Polish and uh, Celeste. Um, uh, my book agent, who are really, we're all working to help people get knowledge. And we don't always even agree with each other, but, but to help people get knowledge about, look, there's a better way than what you're doing now. And try this, try that, and, and see what works. And, and it's, um, it's actually a lot of work, but when you get those emails, the ones I'm sure you get from people who say, I, you know, I cooked my butt off <laughs> and, uh, and, and literally I cooked my butt off and I lost 20 pounds and I got my energy back and, you know, I fit in my dresses or, or whatever it is. It, it actually feels good. And, and you know that you've done something that, that's incredibly important for someone, even if you don't know who they are.
Yeah, no, I'm, I'm totally with you. Um, the people who buy my books are usually very vocal about how they feel good or bad. And um, I take, you know, the criticism and then the compliments and stride. And uh, but I get thousands of comments uh, from people telling me that they've lost weight thanks to a recipe, thanks to something I said. And it, that is a wonderful feeling in it, particular being particularly being a chef who contributed to the poor health of my clients for so many years. I think I have a lot of amends to make, so this is how I'm doing it. Um, and cooking your butt off is not just um, a, a title that I created, you know, in a room full of marketing experts. With my book, you actually do cook your butt off because I design these recipes so that they burn more calories than they contain. So you are literally moot calorie forward at every step. Um, and you might think this is extreme, and I, and, and I know what Bulletproof is all about and uh, how you encourage the, you know, the, the fat, uh, fats. The, 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 uh, it's sort of a little bit uh, contrary to what I advise people we, we to don't do, have but to it doesn't, it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah, we don't it have to agree matter. to have a good conversation or to help a lot of people, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it doesn't matter. And, and I do agree with you. And by the way, you and I can do it, and, and we'll be fine. But for the average overweight or obese person, they need to take drastic measures yeah. to make giant changes. And for me, the be the only way I know how to give them tools that they can work with are to take all the junk out of food, take it apart, put it back together with only the good stuff and make it make sure it tastes good. And if you make that step, whether or not you go high fat or low fat, right? It, like, Right. So many people are focused both on... Both work. We know that both work. Yeah, yeah. They do. And, and so many people are focused on like, oh, it's just about the calories. I'm going to just drink my you know, 1,200 calories of, of Coke every day. And, and yeah. magically, no. <laughs> something, something different happens than if you eat yeah. you know, 1,200 calories of eggs. Like, exactly. It, it's not that hard for you and I to envision that. But there are people who will swear, and I mean swear like with F words all over the place online, when you say that actually, no, those aren't the same thing. Um, because there's this this calorie centric thing, and then there's the high fat versus low fat. But very few people are talking about the avoid toxin route. And if you right. cut toxins, right. you cut inflammation, and you can eat low right. fat, you can eat high fat, and right. you still have moved so far in the right direction. Yeah. But for most people, cutting toxins out of their life is nearly impossible. Think about our food supply and how yeah. toxic it is. You know, at the very at the very heart of it, it's it's almost impossible to avoid the toxins that we find in our foods. I talk about it and cook your bucket butt off for about 10 pages. And uh, I, I serve my um, clients only organic foods. And let me tell you, it's very difficult to find only organic foods when you have to create um, a, you know, a, a wide variety of dishes for people to eat. I feed people, um, I, I send out about 6,000 meals a month right now to my clients who I'm helping to maintain their weight or send them food for convenience. Uh, or gain weight in some cases where people have Crohn's disease, um, or put them on an anti-inflammatory diet because they have psoriatic arthritis. Um, uh, and it's almost impossible to find foods that are local, uh, that are from a sustainable source, uh, that are fair trade, that are organic, that, you know, check all those boxes. But I, I at least start with organic because... God, what, what's in our food system is really the enemy and what we need to avoid. Where do you get your butter? My butter? What's your source for your butter? Yeah. I, I typically use Kerry Gold Butter, which is from Ireland, which okay. is, okay. it's actually 10% grain fed during parts of the year and 30% okay. of that, so 3% of the total food may be from GMO grains. And I've started a petition to get them to fix it. So that that's what I, wow. okay. I typically yeah. use. And anytime I can get it, I will go for the most local, most grass fed option. And right. it, one of the problems that, that I run into, 6 million people came to the Bulletproof blog last year, like unique people. And wow. there were two shortages of grass fed butter in the US that Bulletproof Coffee was a major contributor to. <laughs> uh, and so oh. how do I go to someone in, you know, in Texas? I don't mean Austin, but I mean the rest of Texas. 
and say, look, you need to go to your local supermarket and you need to buy grass-fed butter because it's so much better than the crap-fed butter that you probably are eating or the margarine that's even worse. Right. The only thing on the shelf is Kerrygold because they have wide distribution and it's so far above, even though it's not as perfect as go to your farmer's market and get you know the little crock of precious mm -hmm. grass-fed deliciousness yeah. that we all want but probably don't have access to. Do you know Dan Barber? I uh, don't think so. Dan Barber is a chef who, who is interested in the same things you and I are interested in. And he has a farm where he raises cattle and produces grass-fed butter. Uh, we have to connect you guys. Maybe he could supply you with his butter. I would. Although he claims, he claims he can't make enough for his own use. So we'll see. I would be grateful to meet him. <laughs> One of the things I, I've done this year is um, I bought a 32-acre property on Vancouver Island and we're turning it into an organic Beautiful farm. Beautiful place. Wow. wow. Already the front four acres create grass that feed grass-fed cattle, but they're not milk cattle, they're meat cattle. So the meat that I'm eating ate the grass from my front yard. And I am looking to make enough food on the on the property to feed my local community. Not all of them, but a lot of them, because there's a lot yeah. of fertility here. But also, I want to feed my family and I want to feed myself yeah. and become more into the, the soil ecology and the, the farming, mm -hmm. because by understanding that, it's going to allow me to do better things in Santa Monica at my restaurant and to, to work with sure. growers. Like I, I feel like I owe that to myself and my family and to my, my people, my community, to go that deep. Um, plus, like it's kind of cool. <laughs> it's so cool and so fun, and I applaud you for doing that. Thirty-two acres is is a big commitment. I have a I have a half an acre, and I use a third of it every summer, you know, out east uh, to grow vegetables, and it makes me feel wonderful to walk out in the in the dewy mornings and see what you know nature has ripened for us to eat that day. Um, the process of of sowing and harvesting. Uh, you know, it feels as natural as uh, the most important things in life. And I think uh, I talk about it in my book, growing something, anything will change your life. Even the basil, you know, in the summer, everyone has tomato yeah. and basil salads. Grow the basil on your doorstep if you have to. If you go to Italy, France and Spain or hippie communes, the, the four groups of people that actually know how to do this and sustain <laughs> this kind of lifestyle. Um, think about the hippies in the 60s. Didn't they teach us everything we needed to know about you know, a sustainable lifestyle and culture and community? I mean, they basically copied the Italians. It's, it's not, not a secret. <laughs> but if you go to Italy, everyone is growing something, even people with tiny little terraces. They've got a pot of strawberries, a pot of basil, a pot of mint, and uh, everyone should be growing something. First of all, it's, it's like free. You know, the cost of seeds are, is so low compared to buying a pound of basil for $15. And it also helps debunk the myth that healthy is more expensive, which is one of the most annoying myths yeah. that I, I, I deal with on a daily basis. Everyone's constantly, you know, blaming me, you know, for spending too much money on food. And uh, I say, you know, what what is it going to cost you? What is being unhealthy going to cost you when the primary income earner in your home dies at 50 from type 2 diabetes. You know, yeah. think about that. <laughs> like, what are the co-payments every month of all the medications you have to take cost you? Uh, and then on the merits, I always talk about pound for pound, broccoli is cheaper than Hot Pockets. There's, there's no way around it, you know? Um, that is absolutely true, although broccoli is mostly water. So when you, when you take but, out the water, it's not... <laughs> It's mostly water that you should consume with all the fiber. It's good for you to oh, consume. Oh yeah, it. yeah. The yeah. water is good for you, but you're, yeah. so, you're probably gonna be hungry if you eat, you know, a pound of broccoli versus a pound of hot pocket. Although you well, might vomit pound, after I, the hot I'd, pocket. I'd rather you eat a pound of broccoli with a pound of butter than a pound of hot pocket. Uh, that's for sure. Amen, brother. <laughs> uh, we're we're so on the same page there uh, because it, it is about quality and chemicals and and all those other things, and the the cost thing is something that that I hear a lot too. And the cool thing is. If you know where to shop for vegetables and you're, you're buying from a farmer, just about everywhere you go, you can get at farmer's markets now. And what you don't know is that if that farmer goes to a big grocer, even like a big organic, you know, hippie grocer, they're selling their stuff for like a quarter a pound or a buck a pound and you're paying five or six dollars a pound and the farmer didn't make the money. 
He didn't put it into new tractors. He didn't put it into upgrading what he's doing. It went into the distribution and selling system. But if you go to the farmer's market and you pay two or three bucks, the farmer's just completely stoked. He was able to maintain his farm instead of selling it to big business. And yeah. you save money, but the people who lose are actually like the big box stores who want to sell you big boxes of nicely packaged crackers. Uh, um, right. And, and peppers that came from Belgium, you know, that traveled 5,000 miles. Uh, I'm all about the local. Whatever you can get that's local is a great thing. Uh, I remember um, shopping a couple of years ago in a in a very fancy store that uh, sells very expensive, um, better quote better for you foods, um, and asking about the provenance of some of the apples they had. And uh, I developed this conversation with one of the produce managers and. Um, they they actually resourced and, and searched out a local grower. I was like, you know, we're in New York State. It's the fall. We, we should have some local apples. And, you know, sk skip ahead a few years. Now all they have is local apples, and they have little signs on the display that give you the farmer's yeah. name, their location, their Match.com profile. I mean, it's crazy. But that that's an example of one person having a conversation making change and and we all can make change or maintain the status quo with the choices we make and you know asking going to a farmers market and buying by the way at a farmers market at the end of the day this is the secret about farmers yeah. market go to, at the end of the day they'll sell they'll sell you a garbage bag full of apples for a dollar or five dollars just so they don't have to take it back to the farm yeah, you can definitely get those last minute savings and uh, the farmers don't like it on one hand. On the other hand, they didn't want to have to make applesauce because they're not going to throw away perfectly good apples because they, right. the, they know how hard right. it was to make them. They're going to save them right. somehow. And you know, the, there's another thing that you, you have to remember that when you buy local, you're reducing food miles. Now, yeah. we talk about food miles all the time, right? The average food has 5,000 food miles, blah, blah, blah. And it's important because there's a loss of nutrition. Forget about the loss of nutrition. How about the cost of all the fuel yeah. that it takes to transport that, that bell pepper or piece of asparagus in January from you know, uh, southern Mexico to your door? Well, what, does it, what does that mean for the Middle East peace crisis, for, for our dependency on foreign oil? It's crazy. It's crazy how, yeah. Uh, let's talk about deaths per calorie, right? So if, if you're a vegan and you have a truck full of broccoli and it's going 70 miles an hour through a bug infested zone, how many bugs died to bring you your broccoli if it had to go 5,000 miles? Like more than you would like, right? A lot. And so, That's an interesting perspective. I've never thought of that. And we're going to need those bugs someday because we're going to run out of food in about 50 years. Yeah, they're, they're kind of tasty. You've had, have you tried the new cricket flour? I, of course I have, yes. Yeah, what did you it. think? Yeah. I can make anything taste good. I don't have to. I'm not worried about it. It's all about balance. Every everything you eat is a combination of sour, salt, sweet, bitter. You just got to know how to pull it together. Yeah, it, it's got to be related to cooking crab. But I I didn't find the, the the first experiments I've had particularly wonderful and tasty. But I'm sure it'll get better over time too. We're just what learning. I'm worried about is that it's a it's a really valuable source of protein. The sustainability is through the roof. You know the the calorie to uh, the input and output is incredible, uh, the ratio of calorie to calorie. Um, but the first few entrepreneurs in the cricket business, cricket protein business, aren't chefs. So they're making bars that aren't the best taste. I think it's going to put people off at you yeah. know, some point before we even learn to fall in love with it. So I don't know. I don't know, Dave. Maybe you and I need to get into that and figure it out. I'm, I, I, we can talk about it. I, I'm friends with some of the people working on it. Yeah. Uh, the, my friend Megan over at Biddy and the guys over at EXO. And uh, you know, it's it, it's an interesting idea. And I want to I want to see the the full biochemistry. And I'm still worried about the the fatty acid profile and the oxidation. And you know, are we going to see allergies like you see from shellfish? But eventually, uh, there's a certain point where you're like, all right, I want to eat healthy. And I have X amount of dollars, and I can get this much cricket, and it's healthy, and I can get this much, you know, industrial beef, and it's not beef. healthy. Yeah, You're like, right. uh, I think I'll have the cricket steak, and yeah. you know, maybe that's that's the right thing to do. I, I have no idea, yeah. but uh, I, I suspect we're getting there. Algae and crickets might be what our great grandkids eat for breakfast. Algae is, is a great thing to eat. Sure, that's um, 
th that might be part a big part of our future. You're right. One of the things I, I like about what you've done and, and cook your butt off and just the way you think about it is you're one of the, the few, in fact, probably the only chef I know of who works with the quantitative tracking stuff. Like you work with Fitbit. Uh, and you're actually like helping people understand what they're doing to control their food and also yeah. like their movement while they're cooking using a Fitbit, which is a, a totally unique angle. Uh, and I, I wanted to explore that a bit more with you because I'm, uh, I was a, a CTO of one of the wristband tracking companies uh, oh my goodness. a few wow. years back. Um, yeah, the the basis wristband. Yeah, I, I was a co-founder of their American entity. I, I was not there for a super long time, but really got into the that space. And I was I was actually really intrigued when I read that you were working on incorporating that into a, a book from the perspective of a chef, like, like the idea of, of moving out of the commercial restaurant into your kitchen, making cooking a physical activity, tracking what it does to you, tracking what you put into your body, into your food. Like you've kind of become a bit of a biohacker. Like was this, <laughs> was this on purpose or what? Thank you. Well, I've been I've been wearing uh, activity trackers for. A long time, ever since I started in it, doing triathlons in 2005, six, um, you know the Garmin GP. You know that was that was a critical piece of technology that you had to have if you were going to be a serious or a triathlete. That even not a serious triathlete, but one that crossed the finish line alive. How about that? That was my there goal go. back then. Uh, triathlons are so difficult that any advantage you can give yourself, you give yourself. One of the things I loved about it was the gear. So the, I never lost my love for the gear. And uh, in the time since I started uh, triathlons, uh, wearables have become a gigantic industry, right? And Fitbit uh, is one of my favorites. I'm, I'm now an ambassador for Fitbit, uh, which happened after they became my favorite, and just, just for full disclosure. Um, and I noticed, so I would count my active and passive calorie burn on a daily basis just because I think that's an important thing to do to maintain isocaloric balance. And just it's, inf it's important information. It's not all the information you need to maintain a healthy weight, but it's, it's very valuable information. And I also use it to remotely monitor my clients' active and passive calorie burn. I also use their scale to remotely monitor their weight, their BMI, their BMR, and their body fat percent. And I realized uh, while I was cooking and, and counting my steps that I was, I was accumulating more steps while I was cooking. And I thought, holy crap, cooking is cardio. I've, you know, I, this has always been true. It's not something I invented, but no one ever talks about it. Cooking is a calorie burning exercise. You can burn 400 calories an hour cooking. So I thought, what if you could cook dishes that had less calories than you burn cooking them? Wouldn't that be cool? And uh, then I, of course, spent a bunch of months trying to prove, trying to prove that theory. And, it, and, it, and it's a theory that does work. Uh, almost all of the recipes in my book are, are calorie, uh, have net negative calories because of the cal calories that you burn cooking them. And I integrated Fitbit because they had this great food log and they were... Um, very ha they loved the idea and they were very happy to give me barcodes that I could put into my book so that when you cook a dish and eat it from my book, you can also scan it on your app and it'll, it'll count in your food log and just take one more obstacle out of your way from, your, you know, from point A to the point B goal of achieving a healthy weight. So are you, you must be a fan of Le Creuset uh, cook, cookware. Those I am. How'd you, know you know that? How'd you know that? Yeah, they're great. Because you're doing yeah. a curl every time you're you right. out the saucepan. <laughs> I, I struggled a little bit in the beginning of uh, the conception of cook your butt off with, you know, do I, do I have them stand on one leg while they're chopping the <laughs> tomato? But it turns out that there's enough calorie burning in low-tech cooking. So what I did here in, in, in cook your butt off was revert back to low-tech cooking. So I don't use any machines uh, there's no food processors, you know, blenders, uh, everything is by, done by hand. So the box grater, the whip, the, the knife are your best friends in this book. And while it may take a little bit longer and, and require a little more effort for, from you, I, I thought the additional benefit, the knowledge of the calorie burn would make it totally worth it. 
I find the box grater is actually more efficient than a food processor for anything but a very large meal because you have to wash the darn food processor and the box grater just goes in the dishwasher. It, yeah, it's so much less work. <laughs> oh, you wash your box grater? Uh, well, I, I never heard of that. Before. I rinse it a little bit, you know. But I, I, chefs are famous for never washing their equipment, right? We love, <laughs> we love it seasoned and old and carbonized and. Uh, but yeah, the, the box grater, one of the greatest inventions ever. You can do so many things with it. And by the way, that motion, you know, 20 minutes of the grating will burn about 230 calories. So. Yeah, there's no doubt that moving the body around uh, yeah. it is good for you. Um, I was trying to think of one more uh, way to incentivize people to cook because when you cook, you're in control, not the big food manufacturers. And when you're in control, you're going to make better decisions for yourself. Yeah. You're going to advocate for yourself in a better way. You're, if, if I gave you the, the ingredients that go into commercially made food and told you to make the same food, you would throw half of them away immediately. Yeah. And so getting people to cook even one time a month for me is a huge win. I was I was amazed today. I, I came home and uh, I, I'm allergic to almonds, even though like they're one of the foods oh, I recommend. Right. And it's an annoying allergy, and I gave it to like myself. Anaphylaxis? No, I just or, I, okay. I actually get like super bright red lips, oh, like okay. super like really badly chapped for days, and so, like my so mildly irritating, like that girlfriend who keeps texting you. Uh, yeah, yeah, and it, it doesn't look good. Broken up. <laughs> yeah, and it looks like I'm kind of wearing lipstick. Like it's not a good look on me. Yeah. Um, and I get brain fog from it too. So like like I avoid okay. them. And and five year old Alan, uh, my my son walks in. He goes, Daddy, because I I made crust, uh, but but I used almonds because I just didn't want to crack all the hazelnuts because we, we make him crack hazelnuts with a rock uh, and, and he loves it. He goes outside and he's banging on him and his sister Anna uh, and then they'll do that and they'll make like a walnut hazelnut crust from nuts they cracked because those are That's the fresh, awesome. delicious. That's awesome. And so he was like, I'm really sorry, but you can't have any of my crust. But the fact that he's there with like covered in butter and, and almond, whatever, I have no idea what all the stuff that was on his hands and his face and his shirt, but it doesn't matter because like they're learning to control their food and and like that kind of perspective like is uh, at a party a while back someone said alan do you want a, a piece of apple and he goes is it organic and, and they go <laughs> yes and then he goes <laughs> is it local <laughs> <laughs> he didn't quite ask local because i don't think he knows that like is there's a difference trade? yet <laughs> yeah and he goes he goes is it moldy? Because there's a problem with, <laughs> with like apples that aren't fresh where they're bruised and you get patulin right. that forms. Right. And he's sensitive to that and he knows it. And so he's like, and, and the teacher's like, yes. He goes, oh, thank you. And then he eats it. But like that level, he, that's just the way you see food. It's like, six, okay. Six years old? He's five. Five. That's amazing. Wow. Uh, you know, uh, kids, kids learn what not to like from you. I mean, it's, it's that simple. Uh, and kids love cooking. I'm so glad that you have your kids involved in they love it. To them, it's like a magic show, you know. And it was like that to me at 11 when I started cooking um, just because I didn't have enough money to buy a Kiss album that I wanted. I ended up getting a job to, to, and falling in love with the business of cooking and restaurants. Um, kids are fascinated by the science of it, the, you know, the, the instant reward part of it, the teamwork. There's the math. The, there's so much to um, captivate you and... Uh, and I think parents would be surprised at how willing their kids are to help them if they had only asked and taken some time. Yeah. Even if, if you're a teenager, cooking is an act of self-control. It's about controlling one of the fundamental parts of your environment. And what teenager doesn't want more sense of control? Uh, I, I did a book signing. That's a very good point. And Mission Heirloom in uh, in Berkeley, it, it's a new restaurant with like super bulletproof principles, like ex, just amazing, amazing focus on quality and local sourcing, my kind of people. And the daughter of the owners, uh, Moya, uh, she's 16 now, and at the book signing, she came out with these trays of desserts. She cooked them for, you know, 50 people. They were all gluten-free, all made with super high quality ingredients and, and dramatically delicious. Like you couldn't even tell that they were lacking in gluten and things like that. But she's 16. And she's cooking for 50 people and just having a blast. And, and That's when you incredible. See that, I need that recipe, by the way. <laughs> I'm sure you can call them up. Yeah. I'll introduce you, actually. It'd be a fun intro for you. And it, that whole idea that, that you know, kids can do that and that adults can do that, too, 
And with, with your perspective and, and cook your butt off, um, it, it's really cool too because you're incorporating some of the stuff that most people aren't aware of, like, like how are they moving? Um, what benefit did they get from actually not just standing in place and staring at a microwave where they're actually interacting Feeling with the Feeling entitled. Right. Yeah. yeah, my hot pocket didn't get hot in time. Like you yeah. know, it's a bad day. And it's, it's also a way to teach um, kids at an early age what it means to care for another person. When you feed someone, you're making yeah. a very uh, it's it's a it's a huge gesture that says you love and care for this person. You think that investing in their nourishment is a, is a good investment. Uh, you care about how they feel, how you know their health. Um, when a baby's born, the first thing that happens is uh, the mother feeds it, right? That's how yeah. important the act of feeding another human being is. So Ooh, good it's point. a it's a great way. Uh, it's a it's a great tool to give a child uh, that I think is a little bit lost in our in our culture these days. The act of caring for another person as much as you care for yourself. There was a time where that was a really important principle and core value, and I and, and I don't think that. Is as is relevant as it was, and and cooking is one way to bring that back into the soul of a child. Very well said. It it, it reminds me of, of sort of the Italian grandmother, like eat, eat, you know, yeah, as, as a way of exactly. as a way of providing food. Um, well, I, I never thought of love, it right through food. Yeah. Yeah, love through food. In fact, one of the other things my kids do it is is when they're cooking it, I say, do you know why it tastes better when you cook it yourself? And they say, why? I said, because you put love in it. So when they cook, they put their hand over their food and go, I'm putting that's love in so it, Daddy. Great. That's so great. And they yeah. are. Like, that's part of they, what you makes can food can imbue good. food with love. Absolutely. Yeah. There's yeah. no question about it. My mother used to say it all the time about her famous meatballs. It's the love of rock. And, <laughs> and I really, like, I think it It took me t till she was about 87 for me to understand that you literally can imbue food with love. Um, and by the way, I love the fact that you make your uh, children crack their own nuts because uh, in my last book, one of my tips was never eat nuts that are already cracked because you will eat so many more than you would have if you had to crack them yourself. Plus, I like roasting them first in the shell and then cracking them. Oh, that's kind of fancy. It's, and They taste great. Hazelnuts they, roasted in shell? Oh, my oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. In, in the molecular gastronomy perspective, if you roast sure. it in the shell, guess what? There's no oxygen in there, so you didn't oxidize the oils, like if you crack them open and then roast them, right? So th that's the way that's to do it. That's a very good it, point. Right? You, know, you toss it even the way we used to as cavemen. You throw, the, th throw them in the, the coals. In the fire. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It, 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 they were right. They, they, they did it exactly how they should have done it. And by the way, where did I learn that? From my Italian uh, parents and uncles and aunts who, at the end of every meal, would bring a pan over to the fire and whatever nuts were in season. They're from southern Italy, so walnuts and hazelnuts were a big deal and chestnuts were a big deal. And um, they would never consider buying nuts out of the shell. That was ludicrous to them. <laughs> in fact, going to a restaurant in my, uh, in my upbringing uh, uh, in America, in America, not in Italy, was a punishable offense. <laughs> when mom was home cooking you all this wonderful food, how could you possibly go out? So. Oh, it, it, that's amazing, and and the the passion you have for for not just cooking and and being a chef, but for food in general, and and for what it does for people, it, it really comes through, and and it comes through in your book as well, which, which I think is really cool. Um, do you have a, a URL people can go to to learn more about Cook Your Butt Off? Because it, it it I just love your perspective on this. Thank you very much. I appreciate that um, coming from you. I, I consider it a huge accomplishment uh, as a man of much accomplishment. Um, uh, I'm talking about you, not me. Uh, I thought you were talking about you're you. You're the man of full. much accomplishment. Uh, <laughs> you can go to RoccoDespirito.com, and and there's a big, you know, on the homepage there's a big cook your butt off thing that you can click and learn more about it. Awesome. Um, and there and iBooks is doing a great job with turning it into a, a pretty decent digital version. Oh, excellent! It's always yeah. challenging. I, I know. Yeah, with, very challenging. Uh, with, As a CTO, I'm sure you understand every pain point there is in that process. It's painful, and I don't think we got it right. I I think our my Audible book. Uh, they're like, "Where's the recipes?" I'm like, "Well, I'm not going to read each recipe. Do you like one quarter of this? It, it, you don't read I, recipes." I, I had the same debate uh, with. I, I wanted to read the recipes, and they wouldn't let me. So we we. Uh, we negotiated and uh, came to terms, and I was able to read the head notes and talk about my favorite part of the recipe, and that was it. 
Oh, that's because the, fun, the funny thing is they never include the PDF with the recipes, right? Yeah, it drives me crazy. I want to and give your them away. fans. Yeah. yeah, your fans are calling you, going, "What the hell?" And, and you're not allowed to give them away. So yeah, okay. So you ran into yeah. that. So I'm not alone there. I was kind of feeling like, no. did I do something wrong? But all right. Yeah, that happened with Pound a Day Diet. They forgot to include the PDF of <laughs> recipes, the one that you refer to 600 times. Re <laughs> refer to the PDF. In the, yeah. Okay, so whew. well, I, I try to take care of people on the back end when yeah. when they come to me for that. All right, we got one more question for you. I know we're running up against the hour that we've got. That's okay. That's okay. There's a question I've asked every guest on the show. And the question is, given everything you know, not just as, as, a, as a chef and just as a human being, your top three recommendations for someone who wants to kick more ass. So you want to perform really well in life, do these three things, the most important. Uh, accept failing, accept the concept of failing fast. Uh, if you fail fast, it means you're trying lots of things and you're learning who you are very quickly. And learning who you are and what you like and, and what, you, what you love, what you don't like, um, what your core value system is at, an, at the earliest possible age is what's going to set you free. Um, it took me till about 38 years old to figure it out. Um, and I think it takes most men well into their 30s. Women sort it out usually in their late 20s. But if you're a teenager and you know yourself well, you'll do you'll make you'll make better choices. You'll make informed choices. Uh, so so fail fast, fail often, so that you can learn uh, who you are and what you want to become as a result. Uh, you need three things. You said right? Okay, yeah, so, that was one. All right, cool. Um, uh, learn how to cook. Here's the number one reason you should learn how to cook. Uh, have you ever cooked for someone on a date? Absolutely. Were the results as you hoped they would well, be? I made them get some ice cream, which is kind of <laughs> cheating. <'cause... laughs> so learn how to cook because uh, the best way, my, my favorite way to show someone that you love and care about them is to cook for them. Yeah. Uh, it's a great skill to have. Um, Especially if you're a guy, by the way. Like a, you, you get double yeah. points for that. Yeah. Save more money. <laughs> <laughs> Spend less and save more. Uh, there's an epidemic of spending that, uh, that's another topic, but I think, uh, people don't realize at a young age that a little bit of money saved on a monthly basis from when you're a teenager will, will be all the difference, you know, and when it comes to retirement, um, and will financial freedom to me is kind of like, um, health free freedom and, yeah. and health as well when you're financially free it, I, I liken it to um taking control of your health mm -hmm. and making the right choices and losing the weight and getting rid of the blood pressure meds and when you do all those things you're you're free uh you're no longer constrained by the limitations of the the maladies that you suffer from and the same thing is true for financial health uh, very well said and, and thanks for sharing that that list uh, any Anything else you'd like to say to the 50,000 or so people who are going to hear this this week and the other, I don't know, thousands and thousands after that who are going to download this? Um, where's my coffee, dude? <laughs> <laughs> Have I not shipped you some Send good beans? a pound of coffee. No, I'm pretty sure you did. I'm kidding. Oh, okay, I was like, oh, that, that's a terrible <laughs> faux pas. I, I always send coffee out because how could oh. I not? All right, we'll send you some more just in case, Rocco. I'm going to double check. <laughs> uh, no, I want to say thank you for listening. Um, we've been talking for over an hour and... If you actually listen to more than five or ten minutes of it, I, I uh, one, you're a sadist, and two, uh, you might think <laughs> what we're talking about is interesting. So um, I'm very flattered by that. So thank you for, for being a great audience. Have an awesome day. Thanks. All right, man. Take care. If you enjoyed today's episode of Bulletproof Radio with Rocco Despirito, I'd appreciate it if you would go to iTunes and just click hey, I really liked this episode, so people can find out about it. And a personal request here, if someone you know needs a copy of The Bulletproof Diet, now is a really helpful time for you to go out and pick up a copy and give it to them. I'll send, it, send them a gift certificate. Uh, the reason for this is that I'm working on The Bulletproof Diet Cookbook, the next book in the series, and when the current book hits its sales goals, then it helps new books come out on a timely manner. So I would personally appreciate it if you were thinking about buying one if you did it now and if you do that it really makes a difference even a hundred extra books can be the difference between 
a, a very successful next book and a less successful next book. So thank you for paying attention and going out there and checking out the Bulletproof Diet book anywhere books are sold. <laughs> Thanks. Have an awesome day. And that was the end of me trying to sell you something. But my book is cool. Bye.